when you have the bravery to imagine and the will to get things done. That's Africanacity. That's APSA. Corporate and Investment Banking. Welcome to Africa Trade and Business, where we unpack the vast opportunities on the continent. I'm Bronwyn Seaborn. This evening, we're discussing the impact of COVID-19 on the property sector, as well as the industry's outlook. And with the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement having celebrated its one-year anniversary, we unpack progress on that end. All that coming up, but first, let's take a look at the company and economic activity that's being played out on the continent. Shell has made a significant oil and gas discovery in Namibia. Drilling results have shown a layer of hydrocarbons holding around 250 to 300 million barrels of oil and gas. Industry players say this find could spark a wave of investment in the southern African country, which has been trying to develop its oil and gas fields for decades with no success. Further detail on the discovery is expected later this month. Helios Investment Partners is seeking to grow Africa's digital payments landscape. According to Bloomberg, the private equity firm is in talks with the firms such as MTN and Airtel Africa, and discussions are focused on how to unlock value from those companies' multi-billion dollar fintech operations. Helios co-founder Tope Lawani says the firms are trying to find ways to let those units flourish and not be suffocated by the traditional parts of business. Sticking with tech, mobile games publisher Carry First has secured capital for its expansion across the continent. The South African-based firm has bagged investments worth over 300 million rand. That's in a funding round led by U.S. venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz. Other investors include Google and American rapper Nas. Carry First says it will use the funds to expand its continent portfolio, grow its product and acquire new users. Let's hone in on developments in Kenya now while East Africa, uh, the East African nation rather, that tourism sector has been a bright spot at a time when lockdowns have reduced travel. And joining me for a further discussion on that is our reporter Ntaoleng Lechele. Ntaoleng, thanks so much. So Kenya, a real standout when it comes to a recovery in a tourism sector. So what's driving that momentum? Thanks, Bronwyn. So, um, considering that COVID-19 travel bans limited visitors, international visitors at that, resorts and hotels have had to adapt their strategies to appeal to a more domestic market. And that's exactly what they did by reducing prices. This helped the um, sector bounce back during the period, with the number of Kenyan travelers um, booking hotels in that period doubling, further contributing $1.2 billion in revenue. So Kenya doing a lot to encourage their own citizens to see uh, more of their country, but do they see um, international tourism picking up again? Well, at the moment, uh, Kenya is pegging its hopes on the global vaccination drive with the acting uh, CEO of the Tourism Research Institute, George Kitonga, saying that he expects growth um, if everything goes according to plan. He says that he expects uh, the number of foreign visitors to improve from 2021's 870,000 visitors to just over a million in 2022. Taoling, thank you so much for your insights today. Let's leave it then, Taoling Lechela. Uh, joining us here in studio with insight into how Kenya's tourism sector is recovering from the impact of COVID-19. And we continue on that vein by looking at uh, South Africa's property sector. The pandemic really changed how we all work, live and socialize. And now that there is some hope that the worst of COVID-19 is behind us, the question the question becomes, are those changes entrenched or are we going back to how things were? For a look at how that could impact the property sector's outlook is Klaus Dieter Kempfer, Head of Commercial Property Finance at ABSA. Klaus, thanks so much uh, for your time. So let's start with office property. It was already struggling before the pandemic hit and then COVID uh, further hurting the sector with the move to a uh, more work from home situation for a lot of employees and the SA Property Owners Association really supporting that saying that vacancies are now at an all-time high so do you see the scenario changing or is it instead up to asset owners to now pivot and use that additional space uh, perhaps for something else yeah i think the office sector uh, has suffered from sort of a long-term 
high level structural uh, vacancy rates, or even before COVID struck, vacancy levels were around 11, 12 percent, and they've now sort of gone to 15, 16 percent. Um, and I don't think we're going to go back to where we were before. The hybrid working model is clearly entrenched, and people will will adjust to it. Um, I don't think firms have really cohesively understood how exactly that will work out in practice. There's attempts to define it. And so what we're seeing is very low activity in the property development piece of the office sector. And I think that will remain for quite a while. Well, a sector that is showing slight signs of recovery is retail. Uh, but how much of that recovery uh, do you see being scuppered perhaps by the surge in online shopping that we've seen? So if we look at um, shopping generally, I mean, online shopping is a gross piece of it, but it's overall still a very small component. And I think as online shopping evolves, what you see is a combination of models where it's pure online and delivery, it's online click and collect. Um, you see a lot of traditional retailers branching out into online shopping. So I don't think we've seen um, as severe as impact as we've seen in developed markets like the US and uh, UK and Europe. And I don't think the South African market, the infrastructure and the consumer is really geared to, to have that same level of impact. Certainly not in the medium term. So online shopping not giving uh, a huge boost. We are coming off a low base, but what it did do was give industrial uh, property a boost as you know, the, uh, retailers need that storage space. Um, supply chain disruptions also uh, giving businesses reason to stock up and industrial property benefiting from that as well. So uh, given that, uh, do you expect industrial property to continue uh, to outperform in the sector perhaps? Yeah, I think everyone expects the industrial sector to, to outperform for the foreseeable future. I think it's in extremely high demand globally and internationally. And the driving factors behind that is, as you said, uh, disruption in the supply chain. So corporates revaluate the their logistics change and, and uh, where they manufacture. So onshoring is very topical. And it leads to higher stock levels for raw materials and um, finished goods, and also in terms of the online shopping component, sort of last mile storage. Um, so I think it's definitely a trend that will continue and a sector that will outperform the rest of the property market. Klaus, then before I let you go, I want to check in on the residential property se sector because low interest rates really did uh, support that over the last two years. And now that we are going to see interest rates increase and we're still sitting with high um, unemployment levels, what's your outlook for residential property specifically? Yeah, I'm long term positive on the residential sector um, simply because there's a huge demand in South Africa and that's not um, satisfied in one or two years of sort of increased purchases. So the low interest environment clearly has helped a lot of first time buyers to get onto the property ladder. Uh, I think there's also it, the way the demand is, is driving the development sector will be changing with the hybrid working model. And you can see that already. But uh, I think the, the biggest threat clearly would be a rapid rise in interest rates. Klaus Dieter Kemper is the head of commercial property finance at EPSA. Well, uh, the property sector, particularly industrial property, uh, could boom when the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement comes into full force. It's been a year since the launch of the pact and it's been a quiet year. So let's chat to CEO of Africa at Work, Diana Games, for an update on where things stand on that front. Diana, uh, the pact has been billed as a solution uh, to unlocking intra Africa trade, but as I said, a year on and we haven't seen much movement so what's been holding things back when this thing was first launched to much fanfare there was the, the trade experts warned that it was a long slow process there was no quick wins there was no low not much low hanging fruit so i think that is reflected in the fact that it seems like a year down the line not much has happened but also then building in that we've had COVID and co continuing lockdowns here and there through that period. So that w has slowed things down. And some of the things that were supposed to have been finalized by middle of last year haven't uh, are still being negotiated. But according to the Secretariat, quite a lot has actually 
happened. And you're right about that. It's a huge undertaking, complicated by COVID, complicated by the economic impact that COVID has had on the continent. So if I'm sitting at home and, you know, I'm very interested in all of this, what is a timeline uh, or a realistic timeline, I should say, of when I can start seeing things really start to, to impact people on the ground? Uh, would you be able to give us insight into that? Well, I mean, it, it seems that trading under of certain goods can take place under the African Free Trade Agreement already. Um, the rules of origin, which is which determines the goods that are going to benefit from preferential treatment under the agreement, um, the negotiations on those, which is absolutely critical to the success of this, are uh, nearly 88% complete and workers and they're trying to finalize them. So without that done, um, they can't they can't really trade. Uh, but apparently they don't have to wait till there's a 100% agreement. They can trade begin where there's no where they've ironed out all the issues on on these on these goods. So 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 that is that is the one thing. So I think under that we could probably look at um, the first quarter of this year, if uh, all being equal, that you could start to see things moving. Remembering the trade is already happening. It's just actually what trade happens under this agreement. So it's not like trade, it's blocking trade or stopping trade happening at the moment. That is still continuing as much as it can. So yeah, I guess you could see, I mean, l literally this year, they are looking at things um, speeding up a little bit because a lot of these tricky negotiations have already happened or are well underway. You talk about these big issues that um, have to be faced. You talk about a lot of countries that are involved in this. So then it comes down to political will to get this across the line and to uh, really commit to it. How are you rating that political will to, to buy into the concept um, of this pact? Well, you know, even though there's only 40 out of 54 countries that have ratified it, it's still, this has happened much faster than I think any other process under the African Union. So that does suggest um, a lot of political will. But I think the danger is that people, because the momentum is not there, that we are seeing it's moving quite slowly. A lot of it is happening behind the scenes. I think there's the worry that the politicians will kind of lose a bit of interest and and really return to their quite um, uh, entrenched positions on, on, on protectionism and things like that. Well, Diana, thanks so much for your time today. Diana Games is the CEO of Africa at Work. And that's where we leave things for this episode of Africa Trade and Business. From me, Bronwyn Seaborn, and the rest of the team, it's goodbye until next time. When you have the bravery to imagine and the will to get things done, that's Africanacity. That's APSA. Corporate and Investment Banking.